My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Farah Khan and Shannon Yotsupulu. The phrase rape culture names the many ways through which sexual violence gets normalized and trivialized in our society. Recent years have seen an encouraging upsurge in public conversation about sexual violence and an opening of greater space for at least some survivors to name what they have experienced and at whose hands. But for the moment at least, gender oppression and sexual violence remain pervasive and the impulse to frame sexual violence as normal, inevitable, and the fault of the victim or survivor remains dominant. One half of the phrase rape culture is, of course, the word culture. Part of what that word is meant to convey is that the source of this normalization of sexual violence and the associated shaming and blaming of victims is not some monolithic external enemy that can be easily identified and then denounced and opposed. Rather, this normalization is embedded in culture, in a million little ways that people talk and act every day. It's not external to us, but rather is integral to the scenes of everyday life that have shaped who we are, and is often in turn reproduced by many of us as we move through the world, not infrequently whether we're aware of that fact or not. Challenging sexual violence and gender inequality involves many different kinds of work, including addressing the material conditions that allow and encourage those things, and supporting survivors. Another important aspect, though, is pushing back against rape culture's constant reproduction in all of these everyday ways of this sense that sexual violence is normal and inevitable. Farah Khan and Shannon Yonsapulu are both feminists who live in Toronto. They met years ago when both worked at a feminist organization focused on issues of gender-based violence. They developed a friendship through talking feminism across a wide range of issues and topics in their spare moments. Given the work they were doing, though, that conversation constantly returned to questions related to the coverage of sexual violence in the media. Such coverage is often done in ways that embody the worst of rape culture. Because of the reach of the mass media, such coverage not only harms the survivors who are the subject of the stories, but does a great deal to spread and reproduce rape culture in society more broadly. At some point, the two of them, plus another friend and collaborator of theirs, Sasha Elford, decided that they needed to do something about it. They founded a new grassroots feminist organization called Femifesto. Under the overall mission of working to shift rape culture to consent culture, the central project of Femifesto so far has been the creation of Use the Right Words, media reporting on sexual violence in Canada. It's a free guide for journalists that provides language and frameworks to report on sexual violence in ways that do not normalize it and that do not shame and blame survivors. The initial draft was written by the three co-founders of Femifesto, but the version that is currently available has been developed over the course of years through consultation with feminists from across Canada, including journalists, survivors, and advocates. Femifesto's work has also included doing a range of workshops and trainings, which they have often used as an opportunity to deepen and diversify conversations about how to challenge rape culture in the media and beyond. Since the launch of the guide a few years ago, the hashtag UseTheRightWords periodically crops up on social media, with feminists using it to make visible corrections to headlines and stories that reproduce rape culture. And as both media and the larger conversation around sexual violence continue to evolve, Khan and Yonsapulu hope that the Use the Right Words guide can continue to evolve as well. I speak with Khan and Yonsapulu about rape culture, about the Use the Right Words guide, and about Femifesto's ongoing work to transform our culture to one in which it is not sexual violence, but consent that is normalized. My name is Shannon Yonsapulu. I'm one of the co-founders of Femifesto. I'm really into social justice. I'm doing my master's in social justice education at OISE right now. 
Hi, my name is Farah Khan. I'm really committed to issues of gender justice. And one of the great ways that I've been able to do that is work with Shannon and a whole host of feminists from across Canada on this project called Femifesto. And our main project is the Use the Right Words Guide. Femifesto is a Toronto-based grassroots feminist collective, and we work to shift rape culture to consent culture. And we also provide resources and trainings and education surrounding the topic of sexual violence. Shannon and I started this work when we were working together at a feminist organization, recognizing that we were seeing a multitude of stories coming out around sexual violence and recognizing that when the stories came up, some journalists struggled with how to talk about them in ways that were trauma-informed and survivor-centered. And at the same time, we also were speaking to the media and finding ourselves at a point where we were being interviewed and asked questions that we weren't comfortable answering. And so we really started thinking about how do we talk about this? And we worked together with a really amazing advisory committee and another woman named Sasha Alford. And we made this guide that we first did a test case of it. And then we did a survey with it. We spoke to a huge advisory committee of about 25 feminists from across Canada. And then we created the guide that came out in 2015. And it was right around the time where the Gameshi trial was starting. Uh, that's a reference to former CBC radio personality Gian Gameshi, who was accused of abusive behavior and sexual violence by at least eight women in 2014. So for us, it was kind of this moment where we saw an influx of media speaking about this issue and our ability to give them kind of the information that we thought would be helpful. I was really interested as a kid to make meaning of what was happening around me. So I was a kid that grew up partially in Scarborough, and then we moved to Burlington, my mom and I. And so I moved from a very diverse community to a very monolithic community that there wasn't a lot of brown and South Asian students around me and people to speak to about what was going on when I saw racism or sexism or homophobia. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't have the words for it. And feminism actually was something introduced to me in Girl Guides and through pop culture, like things like Murphy Brown and It's a Different World. All those shows were this moment where I was like, oh, there's this language and conversation that's happening that started to shape and give meaning to what I saw the injustices happening in my life as a kid. And so I started doing organizing. And when I was 17 years old, I got to go to this amazing protest march, which is called Take Back the Night. And Take Back the Night, of course, is a march to end violence against women and specifically sexual violence that happens every year across the globe. And I was lucky to be a part of that. And it was that kind of processing and understanding. It gave meaning to understand that, you know, as a survivor of sexual abuse, I wasn't the only one, but there was other people organizing and that I wasn't alone. And that's been really hard sometimes. We feel alone so much. Just personally, I'm really committed to ending gender-based violence, and I, I'm really drawn to grassroots work. It's a little bit less hierarchical, and it really kind of allows you to stay true to the cause that you're working on, I find. The way that I got involved with this project specifically was that, I was, as far as I mentioned, I was working at an anti-gender-based violence organization in Toronto, and my background was in communications and public relations. And some of the work that I was doing, I was actually working with survivors and the media, being a liaison between the two. And I had seen some cases where, you know, the questions they were asking weren't really questions that were honoring the survivor's stories. And some of the details the survivor didn't want in the story ended up in the story, which has, you know, huge safety implications. And also just listening to the way the media was speaking about sexual violence, suddenly like the word rape culture started being used. And so it just seemed like a topic that was important to have resources on. We were working in a workplace where we just would like come into each other's office and talk feminism. And it was I think I had awesome. like a Simone de Beauvoir book on my desk and you were like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> be friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like, we just be like, oh, have you read this book? Have you read this book? And like this article. And it just started that really amazing feminist friendship moment. And at the time I was in my late twenties, early thirties and Shannon was in her twenties. And so it was like this opportunity to work together. And so we started talking about it and we had a woman that came in that wanted to volunteer with us named Sasha Elford. And we said, you know, this is a project we're thinking about. And she did tremendous research to put together the initial draft guide. And that was a process where we really thought about, okay, if we really like learning from each other, then why don't we learn from other feminists? So we put a call out for other feminists. 
after we released our first guide, we wanted to make sure that we weren't speaking for communities, but rather speaking with communities that we were talking about. So we did a number of things. We crowdsourced the document. We invited folks all across Canada to give their feedback on the document about any changes they'd like to see or other things they'd like to see included. We did surveys with journalists and survivors and advocates and different communities. And we also had quite a large feminist advisory committee of, I think it was like 20 folks that were like lawyers, reporters, advocate survivors, and they also had a hand in creating the final guide. So when you go through the guide, you'll see a lot of the quotes from all of that community-based research that we've done to really inform the guide. Rape culture is the understanding that rape and sexual violence are an expected norm. And it says that somehow the sexual violence that happens to us is our fault and that it is an inherent nature of the people who cause the harm that they can't help themselves. So rape culture hurts everyone. The mythologies about rape culture, be it the idea that certain groups of people are seen as rapists. And we see that perpetuated even in the American election, this idea when the current American president, Donald Trump, said that Mexicans and Latin American people, specifically men, are rapists this idea that a whole culture and a whole community can be brushed with one stroke. And I think that's something that is really important to name. I think also we see rape culture is prevalent in our media in terms of the way music videos sometimes depict women as sexually available, specifically women of color. Or we see that play out in terms of the way journalists sometimes talk about sexual violence. And we see that time and time again. So an example that we use in the guide is there was a journalist that was talking about a young man that was sexually assaulted in the club district. And she said in a major newspaper, one man's rape is another man's sexual fantasy come true. To us, that was just such a depiction of the idea that men should be always up for their sex, that they never want to say no, and somehow it's their fault if it happens because they should have enjoyed it. So you see rape culture play out time and time again in a way that it shapes this idea that somehow we are deserving of the violence that happens to us. And so we keep thinking about how do we contribute to that conversation and why Femifesto, specifically the Use the Right Words project, excited me was I wanted to think of what was a strategy we could do to shift this conversation, to shift it to consent culture. And looking at how journalists shape the understanding of how people respond to sexual violence, understand sexual violence. And we're seeing that now. Like, I think we're having much more nuanced conversations now than we ever have. So I think for us, that was really important how rape culture can be so embedded One thing we learned, too, is even seeing how rape culture is embedded in the way police take statements or speak about a sexual assault that happened in the community. We actually got invited to do a training with the police. So we did some research about how the police were talking about sexual violence. And we found community alerts that the police put out. And some of them said, you know, there's a sexual violence that occurred, but the victim didn't report until a year later. And it just made it sound like that was odd. But yet we know that statistically most people don't report sexual violence. It's interesting because when we started out this project, I think we were being a little bit hard on reporters and journalists. But the more we did the project, we learned that it is really a hard issue to navigate. And a lot of the information they get comes from the police. They pull, for example, information from those community reports. And so I think building consent culture goes beyond the idea of just how we have sex and how we have pleasurable sex. But it's also about the way we treat each other and also the way that companies treat us. So thinking about consent in terms of data collection, we saw a huge conversation happen this year about that. And that's something kind of neat is to go beyond this idea of what we've been told, that consent is difficult and that people only practice it in sex, but to recognize that people practice it every day in lots of different ways. The idea that someone feels safe to say and is able to say, yeah, I don't want you to take my picture or it's not okay to post it there or these are my gender pronouns and I'm so glad you're going to respect them or don't touch my hair. The idea that people's body autonomy is respected, that they're seen, heard and believed And they're also not shamed or blamed. And so for us, building consent culture is having those nuanced conversations. You're understanding that consent is dynamic and changes and it's reversible. So one day I could say yes to something and tomorrow I could say no. Or one hour ago I can say yes to something and then later on I'm like, nope, don't feel like it. And so I think for us, it's really understanding that and really making clear to people so that they understand how consent operates. And for example, it could be there was a journalist a couple of years ago from Ottawa that did a story about a teacher who sexually harassed and assaulted a student who was 14 years old. And he talked about it in the way of naming it as a Romeo and Juliet story and, you know, called it a tryst. 
The thing is, if someone's the age of 14, they cannot consent to having any sexual relations with an adult. That's actually a form of sexual assault. But the journalist chose to write it in that way, which belied the idea that there was a power imbalance and it was coercive and it's not okay. And so, you know, having that conversation with that journalist, and I've had many conversations, DM journalists and be like, hey, totally glad you're writing about sexual violence, but is there a way you could do it differently? And that's what I think about building consent culture. It's also understanding that just because someone has been sexually assaulted and told their story once, they don't need to tell it again. An example is a case with Trudeau. We saw the case where the woman was like, I don't want to talk about this. I actually don't want this story public and I don't want to have this in the press. And people kept hounding her. And that to me is not about pushing the end of sexual violence. It's actually pushing against the idea that she doesn't have the right to consent. And she does. And so it's thinking about who we ask, when we ask, and whose story gets told, and who doesn't want their story told. Give some more examples of the ways that journalists and police and ordinary people sometimes use the wrong words when talking about sexual violence. Well, some of the tools that are included in our Use the Right Word guide are tip sheets on the language, framework, imagery that can be used to talk about sexual violence. And they kind of have like do's and don'ts and give examples of not so great reporting that we've seen. So some of the things that we've seen, just really a great reluctance to use words that makes clear that sexual violence is violence. So instead, when people talk about rape, they'll use the word sex or unconsensual sex, which is rape. And using kind of romanticized terms, which really erases the fact that sexual violence is violence. When there's stories about sexual violence, it's really interesting what imagery is used. A lot of articles people were using were of like thin young white women and they had a drink in their hand. And that was problematic for many reasons. Because number one, it made it seem like there's an ideal victim that is a thin, able-bodied, good-looking white woman and kind of frames that ideal victim as deserving of safety and protection and kind of erases all the other bodies that can experience sexual violence. And it also always included alcohol. So it seems to suggest that because, you know, young women are drinking that they're somehow to blame for the sexual violence that was enacted against them. I think, too, we see time and time again the idea of speaking to the questions that sometimes get asked of survivors. So, you know, what were you doing? What were you wearing? And I understand that it's important to get those details so that people can understand it better. But the way in which we talk about it and how we talk about it is really important. So asking people beforehand, saying, you know, is there a question that you don't feel safe or comfortable speaking about? or talking to people about your questions. I had a really good experience with a reporter that was working with a survivor that I was supporting, and she was really great. She talked over what would be discussed in the story and walked it over. And a lot of reporters like, we don't give the questions beforehand. We don't talk afterwards. You don't get to review it. But I was really appreciative that this reporter did that. And not only did she do that part, but she also, after walking the person through, the survivor was like, you know what, something doesn't feel right for me. And here's why. And she listened to her talk about it. They talked it out. They found a solution that felt good. And they moved forward that way. And I just thought that's so great because it recognizes the fact that survivors are not just like dumping these stories. There's an impact afterwards. And she really talked to her too about like, here what might happen. Like the media may come for you. You might get a lot of questions from other journalists. You might also get a lot of questions from other survivors. So how do we make sure you feel safe? So I've had that really good experience. I think the last one is around alleged. Like we hear it so much. There was one article we saw that was like 19 times they used the word alleged. And we're just giving feedback to folks to be like, hey, I understand that you may not be able to speak and say like this happened because you're writing a story or it's still in the infancy stages. But it's really important to think about why you're using that word and why you only use it for sexual violence and nothing else. And that's shown across the board in lots of different places. So we know with the Special Investigations Unit for the police, when they report about sexual violence, and that's the second highest complaint against the police is sexual violence. When there's a complaint about that, they call it alleged. And any other form of violence that is happened that people complain about to the police, nothing uses the word alleged. So we know that it's specifically wrapped around this is ideas that people lie. And we know actually the truth is that, that less than 8%, 2 to 8% of people make false reports of sexual violence. So a very small amount. What has the uptake of Use the Right Words been like? When we launched the media guide, we also launched an online campaign called Hashtag Use the Right Word because we wanted to invite folks to participate in actually like taking these headlines that are really cringeworthy and quite damaging in that proliferate rape culture myth 
and shift them to actually be headlines that spread consent culture. We've had tweets and posts that have been shared thousands and thousands of times. And we've seen a lot of community response and engagement that way, which is really exciting to see that, you know, people want media that does talk about sexual violence in a trauma-informed, survivor-centric way. And we've also seen response from media outlets and journalists. There was one headline I remember. It was referring to a survivor and it referred to her as a drunken fair. She was sexually assaulted in a cab. And so we fixed the headline and tweeted it back to the media organization to say, like, hey, we fixed it. People are not drunk in fairs. Whether or not she's drunk has nothing to do with the sexual violence that was enacted against her. And why is that in your headline? What kind of message does that send? And so they changed it, which was exciting. But then it said, intoxicated passenger was sexually assaulted in a cab. And we're like, okay, that's a little better. But why are we so intent on saying that this person was intoxicated? It's perpetuating the myth that if someone, specifically a young woman, is drinking, that sexual violence is her fault. And so, again, we put a headline and everyone was retweeting it and sharing it. And so finally they switched it and took out the intoxicated part so that it just said passenger was sexually assaulted. That change happening right before our eyes and the response to the social media campaign and the community having their voices heard. I think it's been also really neat to see journalists saying, if you're writing about this issue, use this guide in Canada, especially around the Gameshi case, but also afterwards. And one of the really amazing experiences that Shannon and I both had was we were invited by Rogers Media, specifically by Ishani, who works at Flair Magazine, to do a training for all their staff. And it was really, really amazing because we were able to hear feedback about how the guide worked for them and also ideas about what to do differently. Journalists really talked about grappling with really hard questions about how do I tell this story and be respectful of the person that I'm interviewing at the same time, hold the journalist like a deal that I have. And so it was a really good way to really see the guide in motion. And we've seen the guide used in a number of universities and colleges across North America as something that they see as a seminal text of students to read and way to understand how to write about this issue. So that's really exciting for us. The other fun thing that we did two years ago was we did the Use the Right Words Award. That was a way to see the pickup of the guide and really see that people were using it. So in 2017, we did the Use the Right Words Award where we had different categories and we had feminists from all over Canada, again, vote on what they saw as the best and worst article. And we had different organizations sponsor a different award with this organization called Activa, who also made a French version. They did a French translation of the guide. And it was really, for us, a neat way to bring attention to the idea of celebrating the good journalism that we saw and really see this as a relationship between us and journalists, that it's not something that activists and survivors have to be in opposition to journalists, but actually can work together. I think where we still need it is the conversation about Me Too. I still think that we're seeing journalists sometimes making choices on stories that are challenging I think we can be nuanced and have those conversations. We need to have them. It's just how we report on them. I think there's such a hunt now for stories about people in positions of power abusing their power. And we want those stories to come out, but it's how they're written. And are they written in a way to push the conversation forward to end sexual violence? Or are they written in a way to push a partisan idea of, oh, yeah, we don't like this party, so we want to push this person out? Or is it a way to be punitive towards people or groups to prove a point that one community is bad or one community shouldn't be in Canada? So anti-immigration kind of slant to those conversations. I think for us, it's been really important to celebrate and highlight the media that does get it and then use that media to propel and say, this is good. Let's support this. Let's celebrate this while challenging the media that doesn't get it all the time. So I know that the Use the Right Words guide has been the central piece of work that Femifesto has done, but you've done some other kinds of things too, like workshops and trainings. Talk a bit about that side of Femifesto's work. We saw the guide as being dynamic and we wanted to learn with it. And so being able to do trainings and workshops allows us to actually get better at writing the guide and updating it because we do see it as something that's a never ending guide. I'm really interested in us next summer, hopefully, to look at that guide again and say, okay, what needs to be changed? Can we put most of it online? Because I think most of it can just go online instead of even making it a guide. So those trainings didn't help us do that and help us connect with the community. It's been neat to actually see the meme changes. So we actually did this really great conversations with high school students and girl guides about, okay, so let's rewrite headlines. We do a lot of workshops with high school and grade school youth, rewriting headlines to really rethink and talk about rape culture. 
we've seen time and time again, doing that kind of training allows people to really realize they don't have to take media for face value, that they can question it, they can challenge it, they can rememe it, they can remake it. And so that's been really neat for us. So we have a mentorship, which is feminist mentorship. So we had a grant where we were able to pay journalist students for their work. And it interviewed folks across Canada and we set up intergenerational conversations with different communities. So, for example, we had two Indigenous women chat with each other about the idea of having consent culture when we're on unceded land and what is the connection between rape culture and colonialism. Having those conversations really went more in depth and allowed me to speak for themselves. We also worked with a group collaboratively called Project Flight, and we looked at a number of things. We helped them to make a stop motion video about clothing policies in high schools and how so often they're really gendered and target specifically women and feminized folks, but also how they target, you know, young black men who might be wearing hats and fat folks are disproportionately targeted. So, and the connection between that and sexual violence when we're not respecting people's autonomy in terms of what they wear and, and how they were shamed by their school. We did another project with them about cyber sexual violence, about what are resources you can access? We really like to work in collaboration and learn. Those projects have been really helpful for us to build a better, broader understanding of what rape culture is and sexual violence is from a grassroots perspective. Where do you see Femifesto's work going in the future? I see it evolving. We really are gentle with ourselves because we talked a lot about self-care as a team. And so doing the Use the Right Words Guide takes a lot out of us. And we've now had to translate into French and into Turkish, which is really cool. And our next kind of thing is thinking about, do we keep doing this conversation? Because we know that journalism is changing and the nature of journalism is changing and the ways we tell stories. So is it about just the media that we're giving this guide to or is it about larger communities? And so I think it's something that we're thinking about. We also recognize, too, that we don't want to stop doing feminist organizing, but how do we support other folks when we do this work? and amplify those voices, use those resources to support them. You have been listening to my interview with Farah Khan and Shannon Yonsapulu about the work of Femifesto, particularly their publication Use the Right Words, Media Reporting on Sexual Violence in Canada. To learn more and to download the guide, go to femifesto.ca. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, SoundCloud, and other platforms. I'm Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, published by Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week.